Namaste. Namaste. Welcome to Satsang. I'm sorry it's so cold this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you all need a lot of credit for getting out of bed and <laughs> making your way here to join us this morning. So welcome back, Pansy. Good to have you again with us. This week is, uh, this coming week, you know, there's a very big um, celebration in our Hindu calendar. Shivratri uh, will be celebrated uh, on Tuesday. So it's always good to know what's happening in our religious uh, calendar. I thought I would just uh, say a, a few words about Shivratri before we uh, come to our Bhaja Govindam this morning. Shiva is one of the very important ways in which the Hindu tradition has thought about the divine, thought about the nature of God. And uh, Shiva is worshipped uh, on Shivaratri in the form of the Shiva Lingam. We have a Shiva Lingam uh, upstairs in our worship space. The word Lingam is a very important uh, term in our tradition. In uh, Sanskrit, uh, Lingam is also uh, called uh, Hetu. And uh, Lingam is that which points to something else. So for example, in, uh, in Indian uh, logic, you know, one, of the, one of the ways of knowing is inference. So the Traditional inference, as you know, is where there is smoke, there is fire. Because we always see these two associated. So when we see one and we don't see the other, we make an inference. So in this case, we say smoke. When we see smoke, but we don't see fire, but we know fire is there, we speak of smoke as a lingam for fire. You know, so, so smoke is the visible sign of that which we don't see. So in that sense, we use the word lingam. So Shiva lingam is that which points to, is the visible form that points to the invisible uh, reality, the invisible infinite. So that's how we speak of it as the Shiva lingam. The visible <coughs> that helps us to appreciate the invisible is called lingam or Sanskrit also, uh, he too. Now, if you think about <coughs> the Shiva Linga and ask why is it that, you know, there are many different accounts about the origin of this particular way of worshipping Shiva in the form of the Linga. But this is, uh, I want to suggest one, one, one way to think about it. God is the source of all forms. All forms have come from, from God, from the infinite one. Now imagine if I have uh, some clay in my hand. I have a lump of clay in my hand. And out of that clay, I can mold, I can make many things, I can make many forms. So I can use the clay, and I can mold the clay in the form of a cow, or a horse, or a tree. So in one sense, that clay which is formless becomes a source of many, many forms. Because the clay itself has no particular form, but out of it I can make many forms. So if I use the clay, and let's say I make the form of a cow, but I want to now make, the, make a, a, a tree out of the clay. Now I'll have to dissolve the form of the cow, reduce it back to a ball of clay, and then make something new out of it. And if I dissolve all of the forms of clay that I make, it will come back into that ball, that ball shape. So the formless clay is the source of all forms. Because the clay itself has no particular form. Because it has no particular form, it can be molded into any, 
any form that I wish to make out of it. So if we think of the Shiva Linga in that way, you know, it is a formless shape which has in itself the potential to become or to generate from itself any number of forms. If it had a very special form, it could not produce any other form. But because it is itself essentially formless, it can be the source of all forms. So it's a, it is, uh, we might think of it as the, <coughs> the center of, of energy from which all forms emerge, even as God. The invisible formless divine is the source of all forms and of all the entire uh, creation. So I think this is you know, one way of thinking about the meaning of the, of the Shiva Linga. If God is in a particular form, God can't be in any other form. But because God is in God's nature is without form, God can be the source of all, of all forms. Now, during this uh, Shivaratri time, and especially when those of us who worship God as Shiva, we uh, recite a very important mantra. And uh, this is the Mrityunjaya mantra. Mrityunjaya mantra means uh, Mrityunjaya is uh, victory over death, overcoming Mrityu or death. And the Mrityunjaya mantra is in fact part of a larger uh, hymn in the Veda called Rudram. So in the 11th chapter of Rudra, this Vedic hymn, there is uh, this mantra that is called Mantra to Shiva, uh, to Rudra, and it's called Mrityunjaya Mantra, Mantra for overcoming uh, death, for the gain of immortality. This is, so it is said that if you can't recite the entire Rudram, at least by reciting this mantra, you get the essence of the meaning of this larger hymn, uh, Rudra, which occurs in at least three of the Vedas. Uh, so it's very important uh, composition. Yes? You know, in India, especially when somebody is, uh, people start chanting, yes. uh, Mithin but if death is <coughs> inevitable, why are we praying for the of that person. Yes. So we, and that uh, part I don't understand. Yeah, so let me, uh, in response to your question, let's add some, a few words about this Mrityunjaya mantra. And perhaps at the end of it, we'll see if your very good question is answered. So this mantra, like all mantras, begin with the word Om. Om Trayambakam Yajamahi. So, uh, Om is really very, very also important in relation to what I just said about Lingam. So, Lingam, if you keep this in mind, it is the formless shape, if, if I can say formless shape, out of which all forms can come. It has the potential to bring forth all forms because it's itself without shape, without particular shape or form. So we begin all of the mantras, including Mrityunjaya Mantra, with the word Om. Om is very, very interesting because Om is not a word, if you think about it. You know, in Sanskrit, when we have a word, we will usually have a root meaning for that word. So like we say, um, Bhagavan, that's a Sanskrit now. But then they will say, we ask, what is the root of this word Bhagavan? And we will say, it is one who has the Bhagas. You know, and these Bhagas are the qualities that define one as Bhagavan. Or we say, Ishwara. We will say, what is the root of Ishwara? It is Ish, to rule, to govern. So we call it the rule of the universe as Ishwara. So when we take a Sanskrit word, we can also always ask, what is the Dhatu? What is the root of the Sanskrit word? By understanding the root, then we look to the meaning of the noun. <laughs> Uh, but Om is not like that. You know, Om, you can even argue, say, Om is not really a Sanskrit word. <laughs> uh, uh, om is composed of three primal sounds, which is the A, U, 
and m, m, m. So when you put these three together, we get the sound om. But it doesn't have a dhatu or root uh, meaning. But uh, these three sounds that make the word om represent three important possibilities of sound. So when you open the mouth, the natural sound is a, uh, uh, which is the first letter of O, uh, akara. But then when the, the lips are closed, which is the other point, you get the m, m, which is makara. You know, so A-U-M is om, and the first, we said the A is the makara, and the m is makara. So the, with the mouth open, the natural sound is a, uh, with the mouth closed, the natural sound is this nasal mm, the end letter, omega, alpha and omega. And in between now, you think of it, with the mouth partially open, u, u, a, u, m. So uh, these are three basic sound possibilities, and in a sense from these three basic sound possibilities, all other sounds are combinations. So, so words are basically, words are sounds, and sounds have these three primal possibilities. Ah, mm, mm, ma. So even as though you would say the formless Shiva Linga is the source of all forms, similarly, Om, this, this primal sound, Om, which are Uma, then becomes the source of all language. So then it becomes an appropriate name for God. So God, who is the source of everything, should have a name that is the source of all words. So therefore, Om ties in as a name for the Akshara. We say Om is Akshara. Om is Akshara. Akshara means letter, but also Om is the name of the Akshara. The immortal, infinite one. So this is why all, all mantras begin with Om. name of the infinite because it has the possibilities for all other names in it. It is a sound that has the potential for all other sounds to come from it. So, Om Trayambakam Yajamahe. This is the, the Mithyunjaya Mantra. So, Yajamahe. Yajamahe means I worship or we, we worship. Yajamahe. And who do we worship? Trayambakam. That's the first important word in the mantra. So the mantra begins Om Trayam Bakam. Om Trayam Bakam Yajamahe. We worship Trayam Bakam. Ambaka means light. Light is called Ambaka. Well, tray, trayam Bakam would be the three. <coughs> the three forms of light. And uh, in ancient times it was understood to be the sun, Surya, one source of light, moon, Chandra, in the evening, and Agni, fire. So, Trayambakam is the name of God who is the source of all light. So, it's called Trayambakam. But Trayambakam also refers to, to the representation of God, especially Shiva, as having three eyes. The three sources of light, and the two eyes, and then Shiva always has the the third eye, the third eye. So Trayambakam represents, you know, I'm worshiping the one who is omniscient, all knowing. It's Trayambakam, one who is omniscient, one who is all knowing. It's called uh, Trayambakam, and you know, especially since we have studied so much of Vedanta, also. <laughs> Uh, Trayambakam, or one who is a source of light, means one who is consciousness itself. Consciousness is the light that reveals everything, that makes everything known. So in that sense also we can understand the word uh, Trayambakam. The one who, the one because of whom we know, we can know. You know we, we remember we studied Kena Upanishad, that which the mind cannot know, but because of which it knows. That which the eyes cannot see, but because of which it sees. So the one who makes all sight possible is also called Trayambakam, the 
source of light. So Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardharam. It's the next line. Sugandhim Pushti Vardharam. So Pushti represents, Pushti means nourishment. That which nourishes is called Pushti. So Pushti Vardhanam, Vardhanam means to increase, to bless with, to increase. Pushti Vardhanam is the one who uh, increases or blesses us with all sources of nourishment. Pushti Vardhanam. So uh, Pushti includes, you know, when you think of the goals of life, Pushti includes all the material things that we need. Artha is included in pushti, wealth, power, success is pushti, but, and also karma, all the forms of pleasure, artha and karma, and then also health is also pushti, physical health is also pushti. So the one who is the source of all nourishment, really, artha, karma. But this uh, interesting word sugandhim is there. Sugandhim Pushtivardhanam. So Sugandhim is, as you know, you know the word Sugandha or Sugandham, it's fragrant, beautiful smelling, beautiful, especially in terms of fragrance, that which is always fragrant, always uh, beautifully fragrant. So in one sense, uh, Sugandhim is a, 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 a term for God who is always beautiful who is the source of all beauty. You know, Shiva is called, the three traditional terms for Shiva, you know, Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram. So Sugandhim is also Sundaram. It's also beauty, or the one who is all beauty. But another way of reading this mantra with Sugandhim coming before Pushti Vardhanam, we can combine the Sanskrit words and say that I am, one is asking for the, all the things that nourish, but uh, Sugandhim there would, remi would, would uh, mean virtue, in a virtuous way. Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam, then Sugandhim refers to Dharma. Because traditionally in our uh, tradition we speak of Dharma as that which gives beauty to life. You know, Dharma is the ornament of life. So one can have wealth, but if, if you don't have virtue, then the wealth is not very beautiful. The wealth is not fragrant. You know, it is, it is corrupt. It is not Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam. So we can see uh, Sugandhim there as also referring to the, to the third goal, which is Dharma, which gives beauty to everything else in, in life, and without which, you know, life lacks beauty. So sometimes it will say, you know, the ornament of a human being, the fragrance of the human being is in his or her own, in, in, in virtue, in his or her ethical uh, conduct. Because, you know, uh, dharma la lives longer than artha and kama. Artha and kama comes to an end for us in this life, but dharma goes beyond, you know, beyond this life. Like fragrance, <laughs> you know, sometimes if you, if you, a fragrance will linger and last longer than the physical presence of the person. So chandan and incense, after it's burnt, it still leaves its fragrance. So in dharma has a longer lasting uh, potential. So think of the mantra, so that's the words. Om trayambakam yajamahe sugandhim pushti vardhanam. So three goals mentioned there. Dharma, artha, kama. But there is a fourth concern about life, which is mortality. There is death. Even when we have wealth and we have pleasure, even when we are good people also, we still, there's still a fear of death. There is mrityu, that fear of death, that anxiety about death. So the last section of the mantra, Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urva Rukamiva Bandhanan Mrityor Mukshiyamamrita Urva Rukam. 
Eva, like Eva in Sanskrit means like Urva Ruttam is a is a watermelon. It's a special fruit, a huge fruit. It's the, so the, <coughs> the Rishi uses a beautiful example here. Urva Rukamiva Bandhanan. So this huge fruit grows on a vine. And but when it is ripe, it naturally breaks away from the vine. It separates itself. You don't have to pull it or tear it away. When it's ripe, it just naturally separates itself from the vine. So it's <coughs> called Urva, Urbur, Urva Rukamiva, like this watermelon fruit. Urva Rukamiva Bandhana. So Bandhana, it is bound to the vine. Bandha, it is bound to the vine, but when it's ripe, it painlessly, effortlessly separates itself. There is no torment. There is no pain. It naturally ripe, it separates from the vine. So the Rishi prays the Urva Rukamiva Bandhana Mrityor Mokshya May I be liberated from death or from the fear of death like this ripe fruit separating itself painlessly from its vine. Urva Rukha Mipa Bandhana Vrityor Mokshiya Ma Amrita So let me be separate, let me be separate from debt like this fruit separates itself from the vine. Ma Amrita May I never be separate from Amrit, from immortality but never from immortality. So it's a prayer, the, the last Part of the prayer is for moksha. Because it is only moksha that, that frees us from the fear of death by helping us to understand the immortal nature, our own immortal natures. It is the only way in which we can overcome the fear of death. So the last part of the prayer is a prayer for the blessing of freedom from the fear of death. So you are quite right in the question. It is, it is not to be literally understood, you know, as a, because you, you're, you're so right, you know, that is, that which is born will die, as we, we teach, uh, Gita teaches that. But what we can be free from is the fear of it, the anxiety about it, to understanding, to, to the blessing of of knowledge, of wisdom. You know, Mama, uh, one uh, point uh, my guru used to say, uh, you know, sometimes when he spoke about this mantra, and, 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 and come into, uh, he said, yes, you know, that it's a good mantra to use also, while it is a mantra that is comprehensive in the sense that it is, it is a prayer for all four goals of life. Pushti Vardhanam, it was Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam, it was Dharma, Artha, Kama, and then at the end of it, there's the prayer for moksha, for immortality. All four goals of life in a single beautiful mantra. But then he would have, he would say in response to your question that if there is, because in his understanding of prarabdha karma, you know, his understanding of karma, he would always say sometimes, you know, that there may be occasions in life for human beings when there may be the possibility of death, but with the possibility of extension of life. There may be more, what he called, more ambiguous moments in life. And we don't know. So someone might be very ill, but it might not, it could go both ways. Karma sometimes is like that. It can go both ways, unless there's something intervening. So then he would, he said, you know, this is why we chant the mantra. Because if there is a possibility of an extension of life, then this prayer may produce that effect, that makes that, makes that possible. Even, you know, the, the, some of those who, some of the Hindu uh, 
medical, ancient <coughs> medical practitioners, you know, the ancient surgeons of the Hindu tradition who wrote about karma, they often said, you know, that, uh, the, that for many, many, for many of us, the karma doesn't mean that, you know, that will occur at a particular time. It's a, it's a, it establishes a possibility, but it also depends on our own choices. So, you know, if you live a healthy lifestyle, it can counteract what might be, you know, uh, 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 might, uh, an unhealthy lifestyle might hasten that healthy lifestyle would potentially to prolong it. Karma gives a certain possibility, but our choice can inform how that possibility uh, plays out. And in that context, he saw the, the value of the mantra. So it's a, uh, a beautiful mantra, and I'll ask you, let's maybe we we'll recite it, and then we will continue. Um, I was just going to ask, from my, what I've learned before, that uh, I thought dharma was your belief or your faith, and uh, you just mentioned that it's more of a virtue. Yeah. Uh, what I've learned is Florida. No, well, <clears throat> there are many ways in which we can think about uh, dharma. So dharma occurs, like when, the way I was speaking about it this morning, there are, in the Hindu tradition also, there are four important goals of life, four important dimensions of life that we should all be attentive to. So one is, you know, we should also be attentive first of our material well-being. That's an important goal, you know, we should secure and make sure we plan for retirement, and, and that's called artha in Sanskrit, that's one goal. Then karma means pleasure. You know? Yeah, we should seek your wealth, but we should also enjoy life. You know, and the Hindu tradition celebrates life and music and art, and you know, it doesn't mean that to be religious doesn't mean that one has to have a long face all the time. <laughs> life is to be, life is to be celebrated in, with friends and family and uh, good food and, and uh, music and uh, the arts. So that's called karma. But the third is, is where there's also a specific meaning of dharma. Dharma means, you know, that wealth and pleasure must always be uh, sought after, must always be pursued with an attentiveness to moral values, ethical values. So if I, you know, if I try to become wealthy by, as you say, by ripping you off, <laughs> I would be violating dharma. So it is good to seek wealth, but once I don't seek wealth in the ways that, in a way that cause suffering to other human beings. So if I, when I'm pursuing my own pleasure, I should not do it in a way that, 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 that is violent to others, that is reckless to the, its effects on my family or my community. So, in, so dharma also means that the body of ethical rules that we should all follow. You know, like ahimsa, non-violence, telling the truth, satyam, giving, sharing with others, all of those are included in, in dharma. But in your sense, dharma also has a larger, dharma is sometimes used synonymously for, when you think of, this is my dharma, you know, almost in the sense of this is my religion, this is my way of, of life. It also has that larger sense. So there are many ways in which the term might be used more specifically in ethics or more broadly to refer to, you know, my way of life, my spirituality, my religious, uh, tradition. So you're not using it wrongly, but in, in different ways. It's, it's, and then of course the fourth goal that I spoke about would be moksha, or, or liberation. So these four goals are called the purusharthas, the four goals of human life. My dharma is one of them. Just a quick question. Yes. Uh, in, in generalized form, we explain Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, mm -hmm. or Shiva as a creator, nourisher, and disturb. So is there any truth in uh, saying Shiva is a god of destroyer? I mean, why does that notion come? Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, yeah, it's called uh, the Trimurti. Trimurti, or the three forms of, of God. And uh, one would be, when we speak, when we think of, when we speak of God as the one who creates, of course we say <coughs> uh, Brahma, Brahma Ji is creator, then the one, who, when, when, you, when you create, then the creation also has to be sustained, it has to be held together. So uh, uh, Vishnu is spoken of as God in his or her 
sustaining role. Have to sustain her. So you bring a child into the world, and then, but you can't turn your back after the birth of the child. The role of the parent is also it has a, a sustaining role. And then, of course, uh, I never. Um, I think it's a good question because it's a problem of translation. I, I never um, speak of when I speak of this Trimurti. I would never speak of Shiva as destroyer. I speak of uh, Shiva as uh, the Lord of Change. Because once, you know, once creation comes into being, you can't have creation without time. And once time comes, there is change. So all the laws of change are also present with, in, in the world. And so, you know, uh, destruction is also, is, 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 has a negative connotation, but change might be good, <laughs> it might be positive, it's necessary, but we don't grow without, without a change. So it's, I think uh, Shiva is a sort of an acknowledgement that you can't have creation without movement, without dynamism, without, without change. And that dimension of God, we should. <coughs> Shiva's Kala, that's, that's the embodiment of time, and change, rather than negatively as destroyer. <coughs> because you know, you're looking for what, oh, creator, preserver, which is a turn of destroyer. <laughs> so can we say that Lingam represents change too? Yes. Yes, I think that's a good point. I think Lingam does represent change. Yes. Yes. And uh, of course, I know I don't need, need not to say this to you. I know you, you, you understand that. It's, I mean, we don't take literally yes. <laughs> three gods. We, we were speaking more in the process of creation, for which we give names. Um, but anyone can be all three. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Exactly. In this society, Everybody wants us to explain in one sentence. Yes, yes. sometimes we simplify it in the process of doing it. If you generate, you organize or sustain, yes. when the time comes, you dissolve it. Mm -hmm. G O D. Yeah. Yes, so these are dissolution is change. Yeah. So that's exactly right. So um, this is very nice. I I thought I would speak a little bit about the Shivratri uh, celebration about um, uh, Shiva this morning. There's so much, you know, so much rich reflection <coughs> that is possible, you know, when we take any of the forms of God or we take any of the stories that are told, you know, like Shiva is called Nilakanta, you know, because he has the, the poison. There's a story about the, about the churning of the ocean and then the poison that came out of it that was threatening to destroy. And Shiva absorbs the poison. It's in this large in his throat. So it has a blue throat where the poison is kept. Nilkantha. Nilkantha, yeah. So it's not destructive. And so, you know, it's a very uh, profound uh, story. Yeah. And uh, I think when I read it, I also ask myself, the question that I ask myself is, how can I become an absorber of poison of others? Because, you know, wherever we live, there's always poison of different kinds, you know, <coughs> communities, in our nation, in the world. So how do we become agents of making poison harmless, or at least destroying poison rather than adding to Poison. Shiva shows, you know, I step forward and I, I, I take the poison rather than let it destroy others. But in a similar way, we can ask, how do we stop poison from spreading? We can define poison, you know, what is poison, what is the poison that is destroying my family? What is the poison that might be destroying?